All right, well, hi everyone, uh, and welcome to the 2021 Tome Stakeholders Meeting and a happy open access week. My name is Meredith Asbury. I'm Senior Policy Officer at the Association of American Universities. Uh, and as we kick off today's meeting, AAU, AU Presses, and ARL are delighted that you can join us for this important discussion. Uh, next slide. As many of you know, Tome will be entering its fifth and final year of the pilot in 2022. We, the associations in coordination uh, with our advisory board are gearing up to assess the program and what we've accomplished and what we can learn from the initiative. And as today's program will demonstrate, open access monograph activity is robust and rife with promising new models and organizations. And we are closer to an open monograph ecosystem than we were when the pilot started. Next slide. In case you are new to Tome's work or need a refresher, Tome is a five-year initiative led by AAU, AU Presses, and ARL to increase the presence of humanities and social sciences scholarship on the web. Tome books are digital, peer-reviewed, open access, and fully accessible in the EPUB format. These formats are made possible by the author's institutional funding with some contributions, a combination of funding from library, provost, and departmental contributions to the fund. Next slide. The next few slides here uh, provide some metrics um, from what Tome has accomplished over the last four years as a representative of AAU which represents 66 research universities. Uh, we've seen about a quarter of our members so far uh, being active in the Tome, uh, been, been active Tome participants. Just this year, we welcomed two additional institutions who've committed to Tome funding uh, for their faculty, University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. So we expend uh, a special welcome to those of you who are joining us today uh, from those institutions. And certainly the window of opportunity is not closed and we continue to encourage additional, additional institutions to join and we do hear continued interest. Next slide. There are more than 60 university presses that participate in Tome and 23 have either published or contracted for Tome books. Next slide. And together, this has produced uh, more than 100 published open access university press monographs financed by institutional support through Tome. And we expect by the end of next year, we may reach 150 books published. This includes over 100 authors, editors, and $1.5 million in funding. So that is a bit of a recap of how far we've come in years one through four of Tome. And we'll turn it over now to Judy Ruttenberg uh, with ARL to talk more about the future of Tome and where we think we're headed. Judy. Thank you so much, Meredith. Um, so as, as Meredith suggested, um, uh, you know, Tome has produced books across um, multiple disciplines, um, as you can see here in the humanities and social sciences, they're uh, fully digital, peer reviewed, um, open access and fully accessible in the EPUB format for people with disabilities. Um, and again, made possible by, by institutional funding. So because 2021 um, looks so different uh, from 2017 when we started for OA monographs, and this is a very exciting, um, it's worth, I think, revisiting this, the really kind of bold ambitions that our sponsoring organizations had in launching Tone. Um, and this kind of is, is gearing us up for the assessment as well. So uh, Tome drew its design and approach um, from a white paper prepared by Rain Crow in 2012 for, uh, for ARL and AAU on designing a rational system for funding scholarly monographs. And that paper suggested the following benefits to institutional funding of OA monographs. One, separating publishing decisions from market considerations. Um, two, increasing the visibility and discoverability um, of these books by making them open access. And three, retaining high quality publishing, including peer review. So that should all sound very familiar um, as sort of themes from past Tome meetings and how we've, how we've talked about this and represented this program. Um, but that paper also 
and the associations, I think, also hoped this system would, would and this is a quote from the paper, signal the legitimacy of digital first dissemination of monographs and new forms of digital scholarship and encourage the development of alternative publishing channels, including campus-based publishing initiatives, some of which we'll hear from today. So um, I, think, um, I think it's nice to look back as we, as we look forward. So uh, ARL, a AU, and AU Presses, uh, we do plan to work with a consultant to assess the program in 2022 and define its lessons and directional um, next steps. So AU Presses has already begun to work um, on the question of what it costs to publish uh, an OA monograph, which is a sort of a pillar of this program. Um, and, and that work will get rolled up into the assessment that we do. So I'm gonna ask Peter Berkeley to say a couple of words about that work here. Sure, thanks very much, Judy. And hi, everyone. The, um, in a nutshell, the work uh, is in flight as we speak. Uh, the foundational uh, research in this area, of course, was the Ithaca Costa Monograph Study, which at this point, I guess, is maybe six or seven years old. Um, and then building on that, uh, a year or two after the Ithaca study was released, the uh, uh, our association uh, commissioned a couple of the principals involved in, in that research to actually create uh, an Excel-based tool uh, uh, that would allow uh, presses to um, um, uh, to calculate the cost of creating uh, an open digital edition. Um, and uh, uh, that, that tool exists and is available to anybody who's interested uh, somewhere on our website. Um, uh, maybe if Brenna is listening and feeling charitable, she might want to post the link to it at some point in the chat, but that's entirely optional since I didn't really warn her in advance. Um, the, uh, the, those same two individuals who uh, created the tool and were involved in the original in-depth Ithaca research uh, have been uh, working with the association uh, to uh, uh, to reach out to the uh, 30 or so university presses that have published monographs to try to gain um, a, uh, I'll say a higher uh, uh, level understanding of cost. Uh, one of the really valuable aspects of the Ithaca research was how granular and detailed uh, uh, the investigators got. Uh, they were on site at all 20 of the presses who participated, uh, did interviews, really got deep into the PLs of each of the presses. Um, that, that's not feasible and likely not necessary here. Um, uh, the response rate from, thank you, Brenna. Uh, the response rate from uh, uh, the presses has been sufficiently high that we'll get a, a, a statistically valid directional indication. Um, I think both of uh, costs um, and um, uh, of some of the challenges maybe uh, uh, presses uh, have uh, encountered or fear they're going to encounter in an attempt to bring costs down. Um, and um, I don't want to steal uh, uh, Nancy and Kim's thunder, so I won't say too terribly much more. Um, I think that it's fair to say that uh, certainly by December, uh, the report will be uh, available uh, publicly for everyone's consumption. Um, and Judy, I know I said uh, it would be just a very few words, and that was a few too many, so I'll stop now. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you. No, Peter, thank you very much. I think the cost, this issue of, um, you know, is $15,000 the right amount? I mean, these are, this has been a critically important question that this group has wrestled with, and it's going to be an important piece of work to, to know that. So in 2022, in addition, you know, sort of building on that, um, we will also we do also plan to engage stakeholders on questions like um, the difficulty of attracting funding institutions. It was wonderful to get the twenty that we did, but why why only twenty? Um, is the program scalable? Um, you know, be uh, addressing structural issues around discoverability. The more you know, works appear on multiple platforms, multiple DOIs, etc. Um, and then impact assessment, hugely important. Collecting, we know that collecting usage data and analytics remains a huge challenge, um, partly because of the multiple platforms, but, um, but we also know that impact assessment is a qualitative endeavor as well. Um, so lots to dig into, um, into there. 
Um, and <clears throat> just crucially, I think what, what we'll do is engage with the landscape around us, um, represented here on the fantastic round table, um, to see how the lessons of Tome and other initiatives can help us ensure a collective funding framework for a network of scholarly presses um, really was the ambition of Tome um, to publish high quality OA monographs in the humanities and social sciences. So I am very excited about today's program. And with that, I will turn it over to Peter Potter. Thanks, Judy. Um, next, yes, great. Um, so today um, we have a, a great round table uh, discussion planned. As some of you have probably noticed that October has been a cornucopia of, of um, sessions on OA books, uh, video, uh, Zoom conferences. Um, I've been to three or four. Um, so it's been really interesting to hear all of the discussions. And um, we hear the group that we have uh, today. Um, can you, uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, the panelists that we have today, I think are really well positioned to um, continue that discussion. And many of us have, have seen those other sessions and we're doing um, really our, our thinking is, is to supplement rather than repeat a lot of what we've heard. Um, so uh, the background of this is, as Judy said, that, that T Tome as a pilot is entering its fifth and final year, and the OA publishing, uh, book publishing landscape really looks different here in North America um, in 2021 than it did in at the beginning in 2017-2018. Uh, just this year, we've seen announcements of new initiatives such as MIT Press's Direct to Open, University of Michigan Press's Fund Mission, both of which set forth new funding models for OA monograph publishing. Meanwhile, the infrastructure for collecting, reporting, and analyzing um, usage data for OA books has advanced considerably thanks to a number of efforts, including um, the open access ebook uh, usage data trust pilot. Um, and um, we have um, Catherine here from, um, from OA EBU. So, um, uh, we really have uh, excellent repu uh, representation here. Um, and we really want to focus on sort of where things are going, what we've learned, what we're learning, and what the future um, holds for OA um, book publishing. Uh, next slide, please. So, our plan for the afternoon here is we're going to, um, we have. Um, really 90 minutes to work with. So um, we're gonna start with a uh, first session uh, for um, 30 minutes uh, focusing on funding models. Um, then we'll have a five minute break and we'll return for um, a discussion where we'll open it up a bit more to talk about sort of how do we make this work um, in the bigger picture and where we think things are going. And then we'll wrap up at the end, Peter will Peter Berkery will provide uh, uh, a moderated um, wrap up at the end. Next slide, please. So for our for this first session, we have um, three um, um, panelists: Emily Farrell um, from uh, MIT Press, talking about direct to open; Charles Watkinson from the University of Michigan Press. Um, with reference to fund admission, and Jeff Pooley, um, a, a scholar-led uh, publisher, uh, Media Studies Press. So um, I will, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of introductory details. I'll let them uh, introduce themselves so we can make the most of our time here. Um, but um, we're really looking forward to this discussion. So each panelist will speak for about five minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So please, um, feel free to, you know, use the chat and um, add questions to the Q and A. And um, at the end of the presentations, we'll open it up for discussion. Um, next slide, please. Um, two bits of, of recommended reading that I wanted to 
to mention as a background for this first session, if you aren't familiar with it, um, the OA Books Toolkit that OAPEN has prepared is really, really helpful on this. And if you're having trouble kind of sorting through the, the various funding models, um, they do a great job in there of kind of laying out the different kind of approaches we're seeing. Um, next slide. And I especially recommend um, just yesterday, actually, Charla Lair of, of Lyricis um, had a blog post um, on open access book programs, answering libraries questions. And in there, she really simplified things in a way, talking about the book models that, that really made sense to me. Um, next slide. So she kind of narrowed it down to um, really two kinds of, of business models um the one-time spend and the ongoing spend and one of the things about this landscape right now and Charla mentioned this to me is that it can get really confusing when you hear all of these different names applied to um uh, the different um, business models and and it's probably a lot simpler than um, all of those names would suggest and I think she does a great job in that post of kind of, of simplifying it for uh, readers. So um, feel free to, to take a look at uh, both of those pieces when you have a chance. Um, next slide. So um, with that, I will turn it over um, to our first speaker, sorry. Um, and we will get going, Emily. Thanks, Peter. And uh, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to see so many fantastic people to be on the panel um, with everyone. And, and with that, I, I'm going to give a brief overview and, and hope not to take up too much time so we can get um, on to hearing about each initiative and, and to have more discussion. Um, so, uh, I mean, just to give a broader overview, something that, that most likely know, MIT Press, we've been around for since the early 60s and our program in general, our books program is very interdisciplinary um, with a focus on distinctive design as, as is well captured by the, the, color, the Press's Colophon designed by Muriel Cooper. Um, we're publishing about 250 books a year, 40 journals, we have textbooks, we have reference works. Um, we're increasing the partnerships that we do, including the Knowledge Futures Group work that we've done in collaboration with MIT Media Lab. Um, the mission of the press is um, to push boundaries of scholarly publishing in active partnership with the MIT community and aligned with MIT's mission to advance knowledge in science, technology, the arts and other areas of scholarship that will best serve the nation and the world in the 21st century. And the reason and that I state that explicitly is that I think that that like, clearly aligns with what we're trying to do here with open access and open access books. Um, the press has been experimenting with open access in different ways and forms for about two decades now. Um, and in the last two years in particular, we've been making a concerted step towards finding ways forward for open access books, um, which have, it's been a lot more of a challenge as, as, as everyone here, here knows. Um, so that, so recognizing that the conventional market models don't sustain monograph publishing, um, we, we knew that we needed to find a more open and more equitable way forward. Um, and that brings us to our model director open. Next slide, please. So in, in 2019, we, we received support from the Arcadia Fund and began to develop a business model to support our open access, uh, to support our monographs going open access. Um, director open takes an incentivized library collective action approach um, to open up new monographs on publication in 2022. So the aim is to open 90 books next year um, if the model is successful. Broadly speaking, we're approaching libraries or the library community as a whole and asking libraries to come together to support opening our monographs program. So it is very much reliant on collective behavior. Um, libraries uh, receive an incentive as individuals. So the, they gain access to our monograph backfile, which is around 2,500 books on our platform. And they also receive discounting on our trade books collection, which is kept as a separate model under a standard trade uh, sales model. Um, because it's collective, it means that the fees are distributed across libraries to reach a financial threshold that we've set and that we've set on the basis of gathering all the information that we could on revenue streams for monographs. 
um, the threshold doesn't change. So if we receive, hopefully, if we receive larger commitments than we need, um, we then would redistribute the funds. So it, the hope is that implementing this model over time, if we see larger support as, as support grows, the fees won't increase for libraries. And that was something that we wanted to make sure was the case. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit more on to, you know, what is it and how does it work? Um, the, the collective action piece is incredibly important. We wanted to be able to look to a large group of libraries internationally to support this model um, so that we could keep costs low for each library. And so far, the response from libraries has been very positive in terms of where the prices sit. Um, the fee table, which we've got up on the website, and you can follow the link at the bottom, um, that shows you the granularity of the fee structure. So we have about 16 tiers for US in institutions. We try to take into account um, size, uh, type, as well as, as what the information we could take um, that we could gather for, for collections budget. So rather than just being a simple FTE based model, we wanted to try to take account of the sort of budgets that libraries have and, and match that with the fees. Um, it's a library centered approach. We did make um, as much of an effort as we could to talk to libraries ahead of launching the model. It was incredibly helpful. We, we modified the model to some degree with the feedback that we received from libraries and we're hoping to continue to do that as the model evolves. Um, we also built into it some flexibility for libraries. If you're a more humanities focused library, we do have a humanities and social sciences collection or a STEAM collection. So there's some choice and flexibility there. Um, there was also a desire to move away from what we have, well, not to move away from what we've been doing, but to approach things more comprehensively. We've been able to open books on a more title by title basis, thanks to book processing charges. Um, but I think more and more the conversation there is that it's it really is not an equitable approach and so many scholars just can't find the funding to open books, even if they really would like to, to have their book go open access. So, um, so this, this model, Direct to Open, allowed us to look at our whole monographs program moving forward rather than choosing titles one by one. Um, it's incentivized because we know, I mean, there's often discussion around the free rider problem and the fact that though libraries may very much want to invest in open access, if it is purely open access, it can sometimes be challenging to do that within the structures that, are, that exist in collection development and acquisitions where you have to show certain types of return on investment and a pure open access model, it can be a challenge. Um, so having an individual incentive like the backfile access um, can help to get down some of those barriers in terms of, of contributing to a model like this. You, um, and as I said before, libraries also get discounting on our frontless trade collection. Um, the other piece of direct to open that, that has been appealing to libraries is that you, even if we don't reach the threshold, you still hold that access to the, through the end of 2022, the term access to the archive content. So um, in some ways, there, there's nothing to lose. You don't have to pay the fee if we don't reach the threshold, but you do still get access to that back file. And, and that's certainly been you know, something that, that has been appealing to sort of get libraries to invest in, in, in this new model. Um, in terms of progress, we are about a month off our deadline. We are halfway to, to our threshold. So we've made incredible progress, um, I think. Uh, we do still have a way to go, um, but we, the response has been incredibly positive and, and that's really good to see. Um, you know, it's only, we're offering it as an annual commitment, but we've seen a third of our libraries commit for three years, which I think says a lot. Um, especially at, this current, at the current time. Um, and yeah, a lot of the support is coming from US institutions. So we do have some institutions in Europe and the UK and other places. Um, but uh, yeah, all in all, moving along well, a way to go, but we're, we're really pleased with how things are progressing. And that's it from me. Thanks so much. Great, thanks. Thanks, Emily. That's, that's very helpful. Um, next up, um, we have uh, 
Charles Watkinson from uh, University of Michigan Press. Many of you uh, uh, know Charles, and uh, he's going to speak to us about um, fund emission. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. So uh, much of what I say will uh, be fairly similar to what uh, Emily just described. Um, uh, university of Michigan Press is a smaller university press than MIT. Uh, we produce about 100 uh, books a year. About 80 of those are specialist uh, scholarly monographs in the areas of performing arts, um, political science, uh, area studies, the ancient world, and American studies, which includes a number of sub lists on areas like disability studies, gender, uh, class, uh, race. And uh, the Fund to Mission program is really motivated uh, by the identity of University of Michigan as, uh, depending on who you believe, the number one <laughs> or number three public research university in the country and with a strong commitment to the idea of knowledge for all. Uh, the slide that you see here uh, shows a site that we are actually launching on November, sec uh, November 1st, uh, which is something we call our accountability site. And this is uh, a site that talks about fund emission and the progress that we're making uh, towards achieving uh, its goals. And so you can see there's uh, a collection of books uh, and uh, there are ways of measuring its social impact and um, uh, you'll be able to find uh, all of this information at that site. Um, but can I go to the next slide at this point? I wanted to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, the underlying belief, the underlying uh, motivator of fund emission, the underlying principle. So the underlying principle is that uh, university presses are humanities infrastructure. So you'll see a map here that shows the 100 or so uh, university presses that are actually based at on campuses uh, in the US alone. And uh, you can see that they're spread across the country and then there are these notional dotted lines between them. Don't interpret too much about where those dotted lines go. They're really just to suggest uh, that university presses are constantly in contact with each other. They're constantly working together. Uh, they're constantly passing uh, books and authors between each other. They're collaborating in various huddles. And so this is a, a multi-institutionally funded network that is an infrastructure for the humanities and it's very parallel in its structure to initiatives in the sciences like the internet 2 uh, backbone um, which mainly supports scientific research and so if we think about university presses in this way as this network of uh, laboratories for the humanities uh, then the funding that goes into university presses really should be thought of by senior administrators at universities in parallel to those major investments in scientific infrastructure. And that's the argument behind fund to mission. And it's built out a little bit more in this paper linked at the bottom of the screen, which was in Inside Higher Ed and written by my colleague, Melissa Pitts. Um, and, uh, uh, at University of British Columbia Press, and myself with huge assistance from Annette Windhorn at the Association of University Presses. Uh, so that's the fundamental concept. And if we could go to the next slide, uh, this is also what distinguishes, I think, the funding model for fund to mission, which is that it can't just be libraries funding this network of uh, open access monograph activity. Because uh, if we think in that way, we're just not going to have enough money, we're not going to have the sustainability. And that has also been at the heart of the Tome Initiative, the belief that the funding should come from representatives of the beneficiaries of the books that we're making available. And a very important part of that is the parent institution of the university press. 
So uh, with fund emission, uh, you'll recognize quite a lot of similarities with the MIT Press model. Uh, we have uh, uh, the goal of uh, publishing 80 great new open access monographs a year in the front list. Um, there is a backlist restricted access archive, again, of about um, currently just under 2,000, but by mid next year, over 2,000 uh, books. Um, and so libraries get access to that for the year. Uh, and the money that uh, we raise is then put towards um, un, uh, making available the open access front list. Um, so the model looks very similar, but the sources of the funding are really split three ways. Uh, so the community of supporting libraries is one source. The parent institution of University of Michigan Press is a second source. And then other parent institutions of authors through initiatives like the Tome, uh, Tome Initiative, but also other funders of various sorts are thought of as a third source. So it's a three-legged stool approach to funding. And what the University of Michigan Provost has said, Provost Collins, is I believe in this enough to put my stake into this model. It's a challenge to the library community to put their stake into the model on behalf of readers. And it's also a challenge to uh, other institutions, not only if they have a university press to support their own university presses in this way to allow this activity, but also to support their scholars so that those institutions are not free riding on the system. So she's laid down this challenge. And what we're seeing is that the library community is dramatically stepping up to meet that challenge in the United States. And uh, our figures are almost exactly the same as uh, Emily's. Uh, we are about 50% to our goals about a third of the libraries who are supporting us, supporting us for, through this three-year transitional phase, 2021 to 2023, we see uh, very little support from outside the United States and Canada. Uh, the, um, the UK is notably sitting on its hands. Uh, Australia is not participating. Uh, and there are, are very few libraries in Europe who are, who are contributing. And that's disappointing because the majority of our usage of our books is actually outside the US. Uh, so that is a problem. Um, but anyhow, you can see with this slide, uh, we are delivering tangible benefits to the supporters, uh, to the provost, we're boosting the reputation of the institution, the libraries receive this uh, uh, restricted um, archive as a benefit of their support, and authors, we're demonstrating their global reach and impact beyond the academy. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm just putting a link to this uh, particular website, Fund Mission, um, in, the, um, in the chat. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Charles. That was really helpful. Um, and uh, for our uh, third speaker, um, we have Jeff Pooley representing uh, Media Studies Press. And um, I will let him uh, introduce himself and take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I'm, I'm really excited to um, share a, a couple of thoughts about the way we're funding um, mediastudies.press, which, as Peter said, is a small scholar-led uh, publisher that doesn't charge book processing charges. I'm also a professor of media and communication at Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. Um, but what I um, wanted to speak to was the special challenges of born OA publishers. Um, that and I want to discuss a kind of emerging collective funding model that I've called the mission aligned uh, funding exchange and maybe I'll just drop a link in the chat to a recent article that I published on it in the commonplace. Um, and it might be interesting, I think, for Tome uh, in, in when we consider its future. So uh, it's thrilling to hear about the MIT and Michigan models. I think uh, it's they're, they're quite similar to the um, CEU press opening the future model that uh, the UK-based COPEM has partnered with. Um, and roughly speaking, I would say those models are analogs in, on the book side to subscribe to open on the journal side, um, which itself has gained momentum recently after you know, successful pilots from annual reviews and Berghahn. Uh, and like I, um, what I would stress is that those are exciting models, but that they 
won't work for foreign OA publishers. Um, the, in part because, as we just talked about, and Emily and Charles um, outlined, these models, first of all, might benefit from established spending commitments on the book and journal side. But in, in some cases, they also have back catalog access or the threat, in some cases, of closed access reversion uh, to help kind of deal with the collective action problem that Emily mentioned. Uh, and born away publishers, of course, have no such um, private good leverage. They have, uh, you could say, nothing uh, legacy to post as collateral. Uh, and of course, like, since the early 2010s, there have been lots of successful single resource experiments in collective funding that are born away. So the Open Library of Humanities, for example, its library partnership program, uh, the uh, Archive, Scope 3, the Particle Physics um, Consortium. More recently, uh, Punctum and Open Book Publishers have both set up successful you know, single publisher membership programs. But the problem with those is that they can't scale. Um, librarians already, and many of you probably would share this, um, and rightly so, uh, complain of the burdensome logistics of all of these one-off funding requests, and including the challenge of vetting, actually. So this is where the idea of the mission-aligned funding exchange comes in. And the core idea, um, just to gloss it super quickly, is to create a kind of um, matching platforms. What they do is they connect fee-free OA publishers uh, with mission-aligned funders. Uh, librarians, yes, um, and libraries, but foundations, um, government funders as well for um, specified multi-year commitments that are tiered. Um, cr and crucially, these exchanges aren't mediated by price alone, but instead by alignment and values. So the idea is that libraries and other funders uh, furnish direct support to these publishers on, on like a web-based matching platform that doubles as a fis fiscal clearinghouse. And the key point is that in this model, funders and recipients both elaborate mission criteria. And would-be recipients also supply structured information on things like scope, governance, licensing, costs, um, and so on. And in this model, the aspiring publisher participants um, are vetted by the exchange according to principles and criteria that have been endorsed through some kind of community governance, presumably inclusive of funders, uh, publishers, and uh, even scholars. Uh, and can you um, change the slide, please? I would say that the, the model is just emerging. Uh, and maybe I'll throw in the chat the link to the Lyricis OAKIP um, model, which um, is the acronym for Open Access Community Investment Program. Um, some of you may know that it wrapped up its first successful pilot this summer. Uh, and it recently launched a second round. Um, it is, for the moment, journal-focused. Um, in fact, History of Media Studies, which is our um, la just launched journal at mediastudies.press, is one of the participating journals. Um, uh, and I, I just want to credit the already mentioned Charla Lair at Lyris as working with um, Rachel Sandberg, who's at Berkeley, and, and the Transitioning Society Publications to OA, with its own long um, acronym. Uh, they essentially developed the model. I, I credit them with it. Uh, and, and including the kind of key principle that value resonance should be the key matching um, mechanism. And they hope to expand this uh, um, project um, by developing a proper web exchange if funding is secured. And I'll just close on the second, maybe more directly relevant to Tome uh, initiative, which is has yet unlaunched, but was recently sort of unveiled to the public as a concept. Um, Copium, the UK-based uh, open monograph project, uh, and their open book collective is the, is the name. And I'm gonna drop again uh, that link into the uh, chat here. The open um, book collective idea is um, slated to be launched in the spring. Um, I will throw in the chat again, a kind of report that the Copium team put out on its core principles. But I'll just note one innovation that's pretty interesting of the platform as they plan it is that applications can be kind of bundled into a single funding uh, funding appeal so that to take one example, the scholar led 
group of publishers would have a single appeal on Open Book Collective. Um, and the benefit of that is you can imagine the sort of exchange participant nesting would reduce some of that um, onerous vetting burden on librarian and other funders. Um, and we at mediastudies.press have a membership application um, pending with Scholar-led and hope to be part of that appeal. So I guess I'll just conclude by throwing out that one potential way of thinking about Tome's future would be to join something like um, the Open Book Collective. Of course, it would involve what using Charlotte Lair's terminology that Peter, you um, raised at the beginning here, a switch from one-time spend to ongoing spend, given the way that Open Book Collective is imagined. Um, but nevertheless, you could still consider kind of participant funders, faculty as eligible for participation in keeping with the spirit of the current Tome model. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to you, Peter. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just wanted to put in a then another plug for uh, Jeff's piece um, that he put in the chat. So because um, it, it was really helpful and um, helpful to me in thinking through a lot of these issues. So and we wanted Jeff on the panel to provide that perspective for the scholar led presses, which um, have become an increasingly important um, voice in this landscape. Um, so with that, we will uh, open up for questions. Please um, list your questions. And um, and we have one from um, Barbara Klein Pope. Are libraries prepared to participate in individual publisher OA monograph programs? Um, so it's really that question of scalability. Um, and are we going to see um, a this this kind of collective funding, uh, the collective behavior um, that Emily spoke about, is that uh, something that we see being scalable? And and please, everybody, just uh, on the panel here, welcome to answer that question. Barbara, I think that's a really good question, and and I have to say, I was expecting to hear from more libraries um, that. This, this sort of single publisher approach that we're sort of looking at, at least for the moment as these initiatives launch, I was expecting to hear that that, that, that was more problematic, um, but, it's, but it's only been something that very few libraries have, have actually brought up explicitly. Um, I don't know whether that's because at the moment there's a real willingness to sort of move in good faith towards supporting these sorts of models, um, knowing that this is still a little bit experimental um, knowing that a step forward with a large amount of open books content for one press is perhaps, you know, at least something and that hopefully that will mean that on the horizon will be a larger sort of an aggregation approach of, of more presses at once. Um, but but it's it seems to be causing less strife than, than I would have expected, actually. Um, I don't know whether what Charles has run into, but, but that, that hasn't been too much trouble. I'm curious, Charles, do you, how, would you uh, uh, agree with that? Yeah, I, I would. Um, and I would sort of emphasize the um, uh, what Emily said about um, libraries giving us the benefit of the doubt at this point. Um, so, you know, for example, with fund to mission, uh, this is a three year transitional period for us and libraries are willing to trust us to be good actors um, and move in this direction, um, that forbearance can't last forever. So just thinking about uh, 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 being uh, ready to be accountable uh, uh, to libraries and help them to manage this system without too much extra work is, is very important, I think. Mm. Yeah, I guess to say also that, yeah, that there's actually been more questions about what does this look like in three years, five years? What's the, you know, what are you thinking in terms of, of you know, as this evolves rather than, um, yeah, but a lot of good faith. Yeah, I think that um, we had a, another question in the chat about um, small UPs and can they, um, can they, will, will this mod, these kinds of models work for them? That's something we'll deal with more in the second session, but um, before we take a break, um, anybody wanna, 
uh, take that on. Yeah, well, just to say that uh, I think it's a really important question because the Association of University Presses, um, uh, over half, uh, well over half its membership is small university presses. Um, and that would, uh, you know, Michigan is on the larger end of that, um, of that, of, of that continuum. But uh, when we say small university presses, we're, we're really saying small university presses under 1.5 million in revenue a year. So I think it's very, very important to think about how to uh, support them. And um, certainly, you know, fund to mission is a challenge, offers a challenge to all provosts at all universities and all deans of humanities at all universities to pay attention to the presses that are on their campuses. And they may not be able to give $400,000 extra a year, but I'm hoping they can give something. Uh, and I do think that's going to be very important. So in any model, uh, it has to be a hybrid model and there has to be a skin in the game from the university parents themselves, not just uh, for the libraries. Um, I think opening the future, I think fund to mission, uh, direct open, I think they, uh, these are, are, are are potentially uh, very, very scalable, uh, but uh, for university presses in the US especially. Great. So, um, and we, as I said, we'll return to this issue in the next session. So we're going to take a break here. We're uh, uh, just went two minutes over, but um, so we will start um, again. We'll take a break here for five minutes and um, be back at 1.52. <laughs> so uh, see you all um, shortly.
All right, welcome back, um, everyone. Um, we um, will now uh, start the second half of our uh, roundtable discussion, and, and we're going to focus on the question of how do we make this work? And we have an excellent lineup of uh, speakers and uh, time for uh, more discussion at the end. Um, next slide, please. So we'll um, start with um, Celeste Feather from Lyricis. Uh, then next will be Wendy Queen from Project Muse, Christina Drummond from the Open Access Ebook Usage Data Trust Project, and uh, Neil Stern and Ronald Snyder uh, giving us kind of the European perspective on this uh, from OAPEN. So um, Celeste, why don't you uh, lead us off? Next sure, thanks, slide. Peter, and hello, everyone. I'm the Director for Content and Scholarly Communication at Lyricis, which for those of you who aren't familiar with us is a nonprofit 501c3 membership association for libraries, museums, and archives. We have about a thousand members, uh, but our programs serve about a thousand additional libraries throughout North America. And I arrived at Lyricis 11 years ago after uh, a number of years spent in several university libraries and a statewide library consortium. So group negotiations for content licensing really is one of our foundational programs at Lyricis. And our engagement in this work with libraries for the past 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, has become a springboard to conversations with them now about the continuing evolution of scholarly communication towards open access models. About 400 libraries currently participate in open programs through Lyricis, and for the programs that we support at the national level, a Lyricis membership is not required so that we can truly really operate at national scale without barriers of any sorts for participation. We know that librarians are slow to act regarding open access because their time is really limited and many of them don't yet have well-developed library policies for supporting open access, let alone campus policies. They need efficient ways to gather and absorb the information that's required for them to make decisions. And in truth, many of the high profile OA programs over the years have targeted large research libraries and have not provided easy ways for teaching colleges and universities to engage. And we absolutely need to expand the support for OA among these different types of institutions. Given the breadth of our connections across the spectrum of US higher ed, we found ourselves in a position to provide scaled outreach to the library community regarding open programs. We've created a new outreach position at Lyricis specifically to focus on our work in open access and open services. And I'm delighted that our new employee begins work next week. Many conversations, of course, have to happen to expand awareness and understanding of all of this vibrant work that is going on in the OA monograph space. We've also engaged in partnership with other library consortia in these programs, and in some cases, libraries outside North America. I'll just take a brief moment to second Peter's comments and Jeff's comments too about the great work that my colleague Charlotte Lea, our open access strategist, is doing that is really advancing the conversations we are having with both libraries and publishers. The next slide, please. So it's become crystal clear to us that diverse models are required to meet the various needs of the disciplines and the library funders. And I think there are lots of reasons to view this diversity in a very positive light. Different models provide different incentives that libraries need if they are to engage with OA, um, such as um, showing their support on campus for a specific field of study or providing companion access to paywalled content, uh, showing their support for open access in general, lowering costs is a big one, and programs that have strong general curricular relevancy. It really seems to me that a healthy amount of the diversity among these business models is aimed towards creating a diverse set of incentives to encourage library engagement. I've, I've listed here a, a number of examples of OA monograph programs that Lyricis actively supports, and we fulfill a variety of responsibilities for each program, customizing our role to meet the needs of each specific one. Our work with the University of Michigan, for example, is extensive and it involves outreach, gathering orders or pledges, handling the kinds of documentations like pledge commitment forms or license agreements when those are required, and all of the fiscal operations necessary to, in the end, send the collected funds on to Michigan. 
We try very hard to keep the administrative process lightweight, yet remain responsive to the local needs when libraries have specific requirements. In our world, procurement processes have definitely become more prominent in our open related work than they have been in years past. I'd like to make particular note of a program that we established last year to support the publishing of books aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This effort came out of our um, conversations to renegotiate a journal package with Springer Nature because we were seeking ways to direct funds to OA books at Springer rather than continue to spend more dollars on the same journal content year after year. Out of a modest pool of funds, we've been able to fund six books so far published under Springer Nature and Palgrave Macmillan in prints in 2021. And we're in the process now of asking for a second round of funding from libraries to expand our work in 2022 to more publishers that have signed the UN SDG Publishers Compact. We've targeted titles that are appropriate for upper level undergraduate curricular support because that was an area of common interest to all of the libraries in our Springer Nature Journals group from small liberal arts colleges all the way up to research one universities. And I was especially pleased to see last week that AU Presses joined the Publishers Compact because in truth, US university presses were not well represented on that list last year. I'll close by noting that scale happens in different ways. Services like DOAB have become vital for the ecosystem, and these infrastructure topics fit very well into conversations with libraries about OA monographs. Right now, it seems most critical to us to scale the outreach portion of our work for all of these programs. And along the same lines, we recognize that we're quickly moving into the space where libraries appreciate the practicality and the scale of supporting multiple OA programs through a familiar administrative process. So thank you. I think my time is up and I'll turn things over to Wendy. Great, thanks Celeste. Um, Wendy, you're up. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, for inviting me to present today on behalf of Project Muse. Wendy Queen, the director of Project Muse, which is a division of Johns Hopkins University Press. I titled my five minute slot from little eye to big eye to stress that we are very much in the beginning stages of defining what open access infrastructure means to our collective missions to create, distribute, and understand the impact of OA monographs. I have to start by telling you my definition because I take a liberal definition of infrastructure and I define it by all the components necessary to support the creation, distribution, discovery, discoverability, accessibility, and preservation of content. And a well-engineered well infrastructure creates its strengths, not by creating a mini grid and doing everything on its own, but supporting a larger network of components and concentrating efforts to preserve and utilize resources and in turn have the redundancy, capacity, and strength of a larger system. I once heard the analogy, and I wish I remember who said it so I could credit them, that a great definition of infrastructure is, if you turn it off, people will complain. So think electricity. Muse's specific infrastructure's mission is to treat open access content like gated content in every respect with the noted exception of access methods. That is the value of infrastructure, lots of different uses, and in Muse's case, we're leveraging the cap capabilities of an existing platform. And the leveraging provides us the scale necessary to support many varieties of programs. To achieve robustness, we partner, orchestrate and experiment in many ways from supporting programs like TOME, um, Knowledge Unlatched, um, CEUPs, The Opening, The Future, um, to relying on critical pieces of the infrastructure from partners to support things like preservation and additional discovery. Um, the initiatives like analytics, which Christina will speak about, is the perfect example of moving from a mini grid, meaning Muse provides one slice of the narrative through its own analytics to a more robust shared infrastructure, thus a potentially stronger result. Um, so while not monographs, I would be remiss not to mention the work Muse is doing to, on the journal side to analyze a subscribe to open approach for journals. Um, and the lessons learned from journals 
are not an exact translation to books, but many of the EJI goals are the same. How do we provide as much equal access to content as possible? And I'm very appreciative that the Mellon Foundation is supporting us on this effort. And I think this effort also addresses many of the questions we're having about how do the smaller UPs um, create programs? And we're hoping we can create something at scale at Muse for them. And there, there is still a very strong need to keep experimenting and prototyping before building out, as there are a lot of mini grids or single use components. And how do these components work together? Uh, Cliff Lynch at CNI a few years ago asked the community that very question. And collectively, we didn't have a, a very good answer. And we've certainly made progress, but we need to continue pursuing the answer. And what I believe he was stressing in his question was interoperability. And that's really moving towards the big I, meaning we really embrace the interoperability as that's the pathway to robust infrastructure. And I must say what attracted me to this graphic on my slide is the similarity to infrastructure to a tree and making interoperability being the foundation on, or the roots to growth and connection. So thank you. Excellent, thanks, Wendy. That was uh, really helpful. Um, and next up, we have uh, uh, Christina Drummond from the OA um, eBook Data Trust um, Project and to speak to a very important part of the equation. Um, please, um, Christina, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Peter, and hi, everyone. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with the OA eBU project, because open access eBook usage data trust is quite a mouthful, um, I'm honored to be here to represent a growing global group of organizations that have been working to achieve economies of scale by pursuing a, a, ultimately a shared solution to streamline the ethical use, aggregation, and exchange of usage data specific to open access eBooks. Um, and wanting to do that in a community governed way. Our advisory board and technical advisory group represent university presses, nonprofit and commercial publishers, open access aggregators and distributors, as well as other publishing metadata platforms and services uh, with representatives from over five continents. And over the past two years, with the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, our project has produced uh, a lot of foundational research to really understand a couple things. One, the issues that exist around open access book usage data. Uh, what are the challenges that we have to address in order to get to a place of real-time analytics as opposed to just recording? Two, what that data ecosystem looks like and what the usage data flows are uh, among parties. And three, the way scholars and specific staff within libraries, university presses, commercial publishers, and platforms, how they, they work with usage data for reporting and analytics. We also piloted open source infrastructure and developing proof of concept dashboards with four university presses, a WAPEN and one commercial publisher to better understand the underlying data aggregation and presentation challenges. To inform our evolution uh, in this kind of bigger picture, we also commissioned a legal analysis to understand the relevant global data regulations that we have to work with, um, an environmental scan to understand the various market forces and different kinds of stakeholders working in this place, and some initial business model canvases as well. These project outputs have informed our advisory board and project team conversations, highlighting both the differing missions, service delivery models, and direct stakeholders um, between the usage data dashboards and what I like to call that data exchange function, which I commonly think of when I refer to the data trust. Further, we learned that if we were operating in Europe, there is a forthcoming data governance act that would require any neutral data broker to not provision analytics or dashboards in order to protect that neutrality, which meant that for the second half of this year of our project, we've been working to prepare our efforts to split into two, one being the data trust as the exchange function, which you see on the left in purple, and the other being that usage data dashboarding service to really help support small to medium publishers who may not have the internal capacity to develop such solutions on their own. And next slide, please. So we're now actively preparing funding proposals for the next phase of our work, 2022 to 2025, with Cameron Nealon, Lucy Montgomery, and Neil Stern leading the dashboard demonstration project forward, focused on those usage data dashboards. 
while I'm working with Kevin Hawkins and others to pull together a consortia to continue the exchange effort that would fit upstream of that dashboarding service um, and other dashboarding services, I should note. Within the next stage of the data trust, we're looking to pilot the international data space model and standards that's emerging from other industries through GAIA-X initiatives in Europe. For those who are unfamiliar with the international data spaces or IDS models and how they relate, um, I draw your attention to the model shown on this slide, which is actually sourced from the International Data Spaces Association at the URL shown. And you can think of a data space as the legal and operational scaffolding for a data ecosystem. Um, much like NRENs provide services to Internet2 in the US or Giant in Europe um, for internet connectivity, these international data spaces are providing that connectivity and the agreements between parties to facilitate those API connections between parties, almost acting as a middleware interface, if you will, between separately controlled sovereign data, um, which also then allows for that secure processing in the middle of the data space that otherwise wouldn't occur um, when you're trying to combine not only open data, but that privately held sensitive data um, that in this case would be usage data provisioned from multiple platforms and publishers. A hope for the coming phase of the data trust is to pilot this data space model for open access book usage data, uh, which will involve documenting those agreements and creating that community data rulebook and formalizing the trust inducing um, technical and legal mechanisms to streamline that data exchange and aggregation between the providers and the downstream data users. Um, so I'll note that we're working right now to identify next year's fiscal sponsor for the data trust finances and staff but we'll also be seeking nominations for our data trust initial board of trustees later this year. And simultaneously, we're also inviting those who see a role for themselves, uh, you know, I know where I fit in this IDS model to contact us because we're definitely looking to build out that consortia to seek Horizon Europe funding uh, in this coming April. So with that, that's all I have. Thanks, Peter. Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Christina. And finally, um, from across the pond. Uh, we're, we're really fortunate to have uh, both Neil Stern and uh, Ronald Snyder here um, to join us and um, provide their perspective. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thanks for having us here to today. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from Europe. Um, uh, I'm very happy to share just a few insights uh, into the uh, OAPEN Foundation and what we're doing. Uh, my name is Neil Stern. I'm, I'm Danish actually, and I have a background in university press publishing for quite a few years, but also spent a few years in the library um, acquiring content and, and licensing. So I have a side of both, uh, a perspective from both sides. So OAPEN Foundation is uh, here to enable open access to scholarly books, and our mission is to increase the discoverability of open access books, but also to build trust around uh, open access books. And we do this by providing three services. One is the OAPEN library, which uh, offers premium services for publishers, funders, and libraries. Then we have the directory of open access books, which is a basic indexing service. And then the OA Books Toolkit, which uh, Peter mentioned, uh, which is a public information resource uh, geared towards uh, authors and, and others who want to seek more information about uh, OA Books. Next slide, please. So just a few words on the background for what we do. Um, when I was at the University Press in, in Copenhagen, we were partnering with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the five uh, other European university presses to uh, see how we could increase the dissemination of OA books. At the time, there, there weren't many initiatives, and we had this uh, project then called the OAPEN project, which was uh, co-funded by the European Commission. And when that ended, uh, OAPEN was turned into a foundation, and then inviting publishers from all around the world to join, and uh, um, that uh, has been going on ever since. In 2012, uh, OAPEN created the Directory of Open Access Books, and then last year the toolkit was launched. And today, to show that we are much more than a European project today, we host uh, more than 18,000 OA books and chapters from over 300 international publishers. And uh, just uh, this year, uh, we also had uh, Charles Watkinson on our board. So uh, really trying to uh, embrace also uh, being international in, in that way. Next slide, please. 
So this uh, chart is, is just to give uh, very briefly an insight into um, the way um, we work behind the scenes, let's say. So the OAPEN uh, library and the DOAB database, which uh, holds um, um, more than 44,000 titles, are pushed through the systems in different ways. So we engage with the intermediaries like Exlibris, ProQuest, OCLC, EBSCO, uh, through our feeds, but also with Google Scholar uh, and other uh, important databases like Base and Core and uh, projects like Open uh, Open BPC and Open ABC. So this is uh, all of the things that really are happening behind the scenes. And and as uh, Wendy said, if you turn off the infrastructure, you sort of turn off the light here as well, and all these connections break. So. Um, um, this is quite important, of course. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, my final slide here, uh, really trying to address the question that Peter raised about uh, how to make uh, all this work. So there are a few things I'd like to highlight. And the first one is really that we need to sustain uh, robust and efficient open infrastructures for books and other open science objects. So I think um, looking at it from the library point of view uh, and with my background in, in licensing and, and also heading the national consortium in Denmark, I, I really saw how dependent we uh, had uh, become on uh, big commercial entities uh, sort of locking in uh, uh, the, the, the infrastructures for journals. And I think there's still uh, time to avoid that for books because we're still in an early stage and we have several open infrastructures that uh, can uh, uh, stay open if if we want to and be adaptive uh, and uh, attentive to uh, what uh, what are what the needs are uh, amongst the publishers and the libraries and the funders and so on through an open dialogue. So we are mission driven. We are non-profit uh, rather than uh, profit seeking uh, institutions. And I think there's a element of cost efficiency there too. Secondly, and um, this is uh, also touching on what Wendy said, I think it's really important that we develop smooth and interoperable network of infrastructures, uh, enabling research output to flow seamlessly in a structured manner between scholars and society at large. So this is really uh, the vision in my uh, view of open science that it's not just about books, it's also about the research data, it's about of course the journal articles, but also all the other elements that uh, together uh, are, are part of the open science umbrella. And all this, it could be open citations as well of course, should come together in, uh, in well working uh, infrastructures that are interoperable. So this is uh, very important. And finally, just on the business model and, and how uh, it, it can be sustained. I think like Charles said, we also work on a, let's say three legged business model. So we have uh, uh, revenue coming in from uh, publisher fees uh, for publishers who are part of the open library. Uh, we have, um, uh, co contributions from library institutions who support us through our library membership program. And finally, we do a services for a handful of funders uh, and uh, that contribute also to our uh, revenue. We've just been happy to uh, onboard uh, Scope Free, the pilot uh, for books, Scope Free pilot for books, and uh, we now host their collection in the OAPEN library. So in this way, with, with these, uh, let's say three legs of, of uh, revenue, we can uh, sustain our uh, funding moving forward. And, um, and that I think will be to the benefit of, of the whole community that we can then uh, engage further with the community and adapt also uh, on our technical roadmap as we move forward. So with that, uh, thanks for having us here uh, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Excellent. Um, thanks very much. That was, again, really helpful in, in kind of bringing things together. If you, um, if anyone has questions, um, please, uh, I'm not sure if the Q&A is working right now, but um, if you have trouble with the Q&A, just put a question in the chat. Um, I wanted to, to start things off, actually. We had a question um, 
that's an important kind of baseline, I think, for this discussion, which is how do we define open infrastructure? And if the definition includes free access, then how do we sustain the infrastructure? And Niels, you certainly touched on that in your uh, comments. What, what, how would you respond to that? Yeah, thanks. So um, I would say that the, the um, sorry, I'm just closing the window here. Um, yeah, so so how do we define open infrastructures? Um, well, it, it, it definitely um, stands of, on a, there are a few things I think that, that are really important. And we've seen that um, in um, response from the library community that an open infrastructure should be uh, transparent, it should be uh, engaging with the community, and uh, it should be mission driven. And I think those are just a few keywords. Um, there are some very good principles for uh, scholarly, uh, open scholarly infrastructures. Um, the, uh, the principles have been uh, written by uh, Cameron Nealon and, and two others. And I think this uh, set of principles uh, are really worth um, looking into because it gives you uh, it gives us a common ground to to uh, to make sure that infrastructures are not just open but they are also engaging with the community and they uh, are sustainable and reliable um, also um and anybody else want to add to that I'll just add um, robustness to the open infrastructure. And I know I use this word a lot, but it is about um, some of that really does incorporate knowing where to have the right redundancies for the best stability going forward. Um, and that's very different than when I described like the mini grid, um, which is everybody sort of doing the same thing in their own little corner. Um, and there's ways to have in the open infrastructure um, you know, much more support, much more robust support for your developers and your systems. I'm, I'm curious in this space that the term interoperability has come up a lot. And um, I wonder if the panelists, um, are you optimistic about um, the future of this? Are we, are we moving in the right direction? Are we um, optimistic that we're going to build the infrastructure we need. Anyone's welcome to answer that one. <laughs> well, I let me let me try. Um, well, at least I think I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. That's for for a, someone like me. That's actually quite a lot. Um, I think a lot of organizations in in our let's say in our infrastructural world are understanding that they have to work together in some way or surrender to the, the large commercial players. And um, of course, everybody being small and being, um, so that be, so there is no incentive to, to try to, to rule the world, but instead to, to join the, the commons. And, um, as far as, as what I see is that a lot of organizations are trying to build something that fits within a larger space. And if there is a, uh, certainly what we are trying to do, if, if there are standards that we can adhere, adhere to, we try very hard to, to do that. And um, also the, the, the things that we create, like the, the, for instance, we create a lot of metadata we make sure not only that it is adherent to standards, but it's also freely available. So if OAPEN were to uh, crash, then, um, then some, somebody else could, in theory, just pick up everything that we have and start all over again. So I think that, yeah, so th this is why I have, I'm slightly optimistic here. Others want to weigh in on that? Um, we do have an, another question uh, in the Q&A um, from Sarah McKee, uh, following on Charles's challenge to university administrators to support their own campus presses. Do the panelists have thoughts on how universities without presses, the, the free riders, 
could support this segment of humanities infrastructure beyond BPCs for their faculty. Um, and uh, she raises the point about, and Rob, uh, Charles has been um, quite clear on this, that um, library support is not enough. It needs to be broader than that. So um, how, do we, how do we make that happen? It's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I mean, not to, to put words in Charles's mouth, but I do think that, you know, it's not just libraries. So I think if, a, if an institution doesn't have a press, there are still all manner of ways that, that there can be engagement with these new models. I mean, certainly library funds themselves, which move, move away from, from individual book processing charges. So like the models we've been talking about that are collective, um, I think that that is a really big step and it's a step in the right direction. Um, I, I do wonder about the ways that research offices or other, other sections of the institution more broadly can, can participate. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a part that, that, you know, is certainly challenging because we know well how to engage with libraries, but trying to bring in other sections of the, the inst of institutions is, is not quite so easy. Um, there's not necessarily always the same lines of dialogue or channels of communication open. Um, that said, I think it's, I can't help but, but sort of quickly grab onto that idea of free rider, because I think what I, what I like in thinking about these new models is that it really is calling for all these pieces to work together a little bit better um, and to recognise the fact that we, we all in this system benefit from, from you know, well-produced, cared for scholarship. Researchers benefit from it. Institutions benefit from it because their researchers benefit from it. So I think that, that you know, trying to think about this whole, this whole thing as an ecosystem rather than what we've been in the, the ways that the sort of structures are in place to think of, well, how am I building my collection for my library? And thinking more bro broadly, for instance, in, in the, the, the diagram that, that Charles showed, which you know, I think I really appreciated seeing, this is a network. We are sort of producing a larger body of scholarship that an institute, even if it doesn't have a press, benefits from. So, you know, how do we message that? How do we bring those parts together? That, that's not, there's not easy solutions for that, but, um, but it's something to con continue to consider. And I, I was just going to add to that that um, I think Emily's absolutely right about free rider being a, a bad term. I mean, um, Sarah McKee asking that from Emery. I mean, Emery is the opposite of a free rider, but doesn't have a university press. I mean, it has multiple ways in which it's supporting humanities infrastructure. But I do think that the idea that uh, an institution might make it possible for their faculty to uh, contribute. Uh, money into the system through what may look like a BPC, right? Uh, it shouldn't be underestimated how that really fits very nicely with the existing structures of many universities. Um, the, 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 there are established structures for doing that kind of um, startup funding for faculty or, um, you know, uh, research funds. It fits very nicely into how universities operate in many cases, in the same way as uh, programs like uh, Direct to Open and Fund to Mission and Open in the Future fit well into library workflows as well. And that's all to say that the message that I've been told to bring to this meeting today from our Associate Dean for the Humanities at uh, Michigan, and also my colleague who's the uh, Associate University Librarian for Research is please don't, please don't get rid of our option to use Tome to fund, to put the, um, the provost's money, to put the College of Liberal Arts's money, uh, 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 literature, science and the arts's money into the system because it works for us. And we're now enthusiastic and ready in a way that we weren't five years ago to do that. So just to say that this is a, this is a channel and we shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate the power of that. And I would, yeah, and, and, and I would um, add that um, you know, with Tome, though, we're as we're looking for the next phase to Tome. Um, this is the big question: is there is there a space for Tome to operate uh, here? And um, we had one question that I wanted to to answer. Um, 
and say it was mentioned earlier that the window of opportunity for joining Tome is not closed. Would you say more about that given that you're in your last pilot year? So um, as Judy mentioned, we've had, we continue to get requests from institutions who are interested in participating. And obviously as the pilot comes to a close, comes to a close there's not a, the, the window of, of opportunity is closing, but um, we still encourage institutions who want to participate to, um, to come on board and tell us how many books they would like to, they would like to fund. I mean, we want to build muscle memory here that um, will continue after the project. And this is definitely something that with the consultant that we hire will um, need to address this, this um, very question, like how do we keep this going? How do we keep the, um, um, the momentum going? Um, so do others have thoughts on, on the question about um, sort of a role for Tome in the um, um, future? I want to second what Charles has said about the necessity of keeping this funding stream, quite frankly, coming from places at the university outside the libraries. That, that's been a big part of our ongoing conversations and that, that sets up potential conversations to encourage libraries to kick in, right? If they know that other parts of the campus are kicking in or it, it's not all on them because what we hear frequently from the library community is it shouldn't all be on us. And we don't currently have that many other places to point to and say, it's not on you. Tome is one of those, those exceptions. And I think, although it might seem modest and meager at this point, just at a very high level, the fact that you're here and you're engaging in trying to incorporate more people outside the library into the conversation and therefore get more shared contributions is a wonderful thing and it should not vanish from the, the landscape. Can I just add to that? I think, um, so I think it's it's important to remember that OA to books is really very new still. Uh, so a few years ago, it was kind of still uh, very much in the in the shade of, of journals. And um, <clears throat> I think also we have to understand the the, the economy in, in new ways, in different ways. So I, I uh, you know, second that uh, talking about free riders probably is not the right idea. So for instance, we we know that more than 1,100 libraries make use of the open library directly at their institution. We have a supporting base of 150 perhaps, but that doesn't make them to free riders. It's, it's really great that they make use of the, all the OA books. Uh, and of course, uh, they I know from inside a library that a lot of consideration is going on and strategically about how to support all these open science initiatives. So I think it's, it's also about uh, uh, be aware that, that there is a lot of experimentation ongoing, which is great. And we've heard uh, good examples today. Uh, and this will this will pick up. And, and we have probably to think about this economy in a different way than the traditional transactional economy where, uh, where we used to think. So um, I really, uh, I'm, on that background, I'm, I'm really optimistic because there's so much going on. Thanks. And, um... And glad one of the uh, one of the questions is uh, regarding um, the Copeem's uh, Open Book Collective, which I'm I'm glad was raised, um, because um, the Open Book Collective, which um, Jeff mentioned, um, much of the conversation is around how to package or um, slip out infrastructure from content. Should a library be able to pledge support for just a content package or just a piece of infrastructure, or is it better to fold them together? How might a program like Tome approach this? I, I mean, one thing about, uh, yeah, infrastructure is, a, is, is definitely an emerging word. I mean, um, I think there is a, uh, there's an interesting model where um, these content collections do also uh, sit on community-owned infrastructure, which is, again, a very charged word. 
I mean, you know, uh, uh, Department of Shameless Commerce, but uh, University of Michigan Press's ebook collection does sit on open source infrastructure, the Fulcrum platform. And one of the big focuses has been on open standards as well. Um, and I, I don't, I, the, the ideal model feels like a both and, right? That when one is supporting open content, one is also uh, supporting open infrastructure. And that need not just be the platforms for publishers who are lucky enough to have their own platforms, but it's also the way those publishers are then feeding money back to uh, DOAB and OARPEN or Hypothesis or other tools in a landscape. And if it's not money contributing coding expertise or creating connections. So I really like the model where it's not either open content or open infrastructure, but both and. I'll just add to that. I think there's a space perhaps for Tome to take the mantle with an advocacy frame because part of this open infrastructure challenge is really creating the, the public funding to sustain this at, at that ecosystem level. And I, I think our, our friends in Europe have a lot more support at the national and regional level that we don't have from the NRENs here in the US. We don't have necessarily from federal agencies. And if Tome could help raise the profile and make the case, quite frankly, for why we need that level of support, I think that could go a long way to, to add an additional revenue stream. I, I know we've talked about the internet as kind of a parallel to this. Well, the, you know, there's a reason internet too had substantial NSF funding because it was critical infrastructure. So if this is critical humanities infrastructure, how do we sustain it as a country? among each of our countries, I will add to that footnote. And, and just at the risk of, of saying too much, uh, to, uh, talking too much, I think that's absolutely right, Christina. And I think one of the things that really uh, is interesting comparing the Europe to the USA is the way in which uh, operas and uh, COPIM and other, especially operas and, and DOAB have positioned the work of books in the open science framework and have spent an awful lot of time making sure that science, the open science is understood to include the humanities and qualitative social sciences. And that is something that we haven't done as much in the US. And I think that Christina's point about NSF and cyber infrastructure and the words that they understand and want to support, I think if we can reposition the conversation to talk about these concepts, which will be familiar to the sciences, um, we might be able to do some of the same work that has ha happened in Europe. Um, Rachel Caldwell um, asks, does the PLOS model of community action publishing through a journal publisher, uh, though a journal publisher model, uh, help frame this conversation in which every library can contribute somehow, maybe through a distributed flat fee? I would say yes. Um, in our work here at Lyricist, we, because we do talk to libraries of, of all types and sizes um, related to institutions um, that are diverse as well. And we are very careful in that, that list of programs that we showed you, there absolutely was consideration about the specific kind of library and their ability to contribute. And, you know, I, I love the PLOS CAP model because uh, for lots of reasons, but also, uh, so a couple of big ones. One is that everybody is asked to contribute but it also extends beyond the, the first or the corresponding author and goes on down the line for the second and third and fourth author to assign some portion of the cost to the proposed fee to their universities as well. So it does a nice job of distributing the, the request for support across the entire community rather than just pay to publish models do. So uh, yes, I think very much those sorts of um, you know, parameters around the PLOS uh, community action publishing model do translate in many ways nicely to the approaches that are many people are taking to get uh, libraries to contribute to ebook programs, and they should be that way. I mean, one of the things that uh, Tome has shown, um, I mean, we came into it with the idea that we, we knew there's money 
um, in the system to support OA book publishing. Um, but could could we? It was an experiment in trying to get that money out there. And could it be? Um, uh, could we establish proof of concept? And I think we really have, in the sense that we have over uh, 100 books published, uh, supported to date. Um, and we have given out over a million and a half in grants. So it suggests that this is possible um, if it can scale up. Um, the question is, how do we how do we bring all of that goodwill together? And that that I think that's where I think there is room for Tome to have a a role. But um, I somehow think it it needs a in, an institutional home um, to to build upon, and that's something we haven't had um, to date. Um, thoughts on that? I really think uh, that um, the thing that Tome has on its website, the very first line, Tome is a movement, not a club. And just building on what Celeste said, um, you know, the Lever Press is another really interesting collaborative model in this open access book space. And it involves a number of smaller liberal arts colleges coming together to support uh, publishing. That's an interesting group who are showing their willing and energy around open access books, but they're not part of Tome. And how do we make this a big tent and not make it just uh, for uh, you know, research libraries, research institutions, AAU members? And I, I think that's something we've got to get over because there's so much energy and goodwill and desire actually to contribute at uh, small institutions. But I think they, the pathways are a little bit lacking at the moment. Mm. Sorry, Peter, that's not a direct, directly building on your question, but. No, that, but that's that's exactly what I was getting at. So yeah, that's helpful. Um, let's see. Um, other questions folks have? I, I know we've talked um, as a group about sort of a federated approach. Um, you know, the, the um, Open Book uh, Collective is based upon this idea of scaling small. Um, and it does make me um, wonder if here in the US, if there's a way to, to actually have a real um, collective devoted to this. And if, if Tom, again, is the, the um, solution to that to that problem because we we you know there's there's the collective goodwill but it is a matter of um, can we can we bring it all together uh, something that occurs to me in in just hearing the discussion and and the positives but also the concern about you know are we putting too many models out into the market but at the same time there's a clear need for the diversity of models. There's a clear need for tome. There's a clear need for you know, other approaches. But how do so many new models sort of exist next to each other? And you know, also to what Celeste spoke of and what Sharla wrote in her her post yesterday. You know, how do we how do we communicate that well? I I would say that there's perhaps space for us to come together to to consider communication um, and to do that perhaps with some, some library stakeholders. Are there better ways that we could be um, you know, making the similarities and differences of these models clear? Um, are there ways that we can consider you know, talking through how, how we are uh, uh, you know, sending out messaging around these models? I, I think that, that that could be beneficial for, for I mean, I, I could see the benefit of that. Um, we had a, a question that um, I'm hoping Meredith um, will uh, be willing to weigh in on it. Um, it's from Kaiser Walker at Cornell. Um, presses and libraries seem to have been active in the conversation around Tome, but AAU is also a sponsor along with AU Presses and ARL. What shape has that conversation taken at the Provost University administration level? Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's a good question. You know, AAU continues to increase awareness amongst our 
provosts and university leadership about tome. Uh, the pandemic has certainly provided some renewed interest and opportunity um, to push for investment of open access monographs. Um, I think the biggest challenge at the provost level continues to be the number of things that they're asked to fund. And again, this is just an, an, another thing that they're being asked um, to fund. I, I, I do think many of them see the value in it. It's just, it's a challenge of, you know, the limited funds that they have to provide um, at their at, at their level. Can I just pick up on what Emily said? Because I think uh, it was a very good point about uh, really bringing these initiatives together and, and be focusing on communication. So Charles mentioned uh, operas in Europe and uh, how we've been really building an infrastructure to bring humanities uh, scholarship uh, in, in the broad sense together uh, and social sciences, which brings also books into the discussion, but books are just a small part of, of that whole spectrum. So, so to bring books into the awareness of uh, uh, um, university administrations can be quite uh, uh, a challenge. So I think uh, bringing a lot of actors together in this. That has been successful with Operas. Uh, Operas was uh, put on the, the so-called S3 roadmap, so being acknowledged by the European Commission as a research infrastructure for, for the humanities and social sciences. And I think that that would be great to, to you know, bring this together a bit like Lyricist has been doing for you know, trying to collect all these initiatives. And uh, and definitely also for us to to contribute in in the U.S. context, which which is it's quite new to us, but but we've been happy to see some support coming in from the U.S. and would really like to engage further. So I I think that's a very good approach. Thank. Sure. I I, I did want to question. Uh, not that question Meredith's statement a little bit. I mean, just in terms of uh, an AAU member's uh, funding, I mean, uh, you know, a startup chemistry uh, faculties uh, lab uh, can cost uh, between $500,000 and a million dollars. So we're not really asking for an awful lot of support for the humanities here. Um, and I do uh, wonder whether this is really beyond the reach of AAU members. I, I think you raise a good point, Charles. You know, I just want, I think um, this is, these have been our observations that we've seen as we've tried to communicate um, the program and try and get more institutions involved. Um, but there are certainly, challenges and, opp and opportunities as well. All right, we're um, at just about at the um, end of the, of the round table discussion. Um, does anybody wanna, um, anybody from the panel wanna um, add anything before we turn it over to um, Peter Berkery? So it's just to say thank you again. I think that it's very helpful for us all to come together to talk about these things, to you know, see what sorts of questions there are. And you know, I do think that that sometimes it can be hard to balance the the sort of market pressures and sort of competitiveness of trying to you know make your finances work as a university press, um, and being able to sort of come together in these spaces and consider what we're all trying to do. You know, what we're plugging away at every day. And to consider it in a larger context, I think is incredibly helpful because I do think in terms of values alignment, there's so much here that we want to do um, that fits together very well and, and is very mission based. And I think that, you know, we do need to take this time to sort of pull that together and, and see how it fits and you know, see how we can communicate externally in a clearer way. So thanks. If I could just add to that, I, I think that, you know, looking towards that collective impact we want to achieve to the extent that we have more of these opportunities to come together, not only to check the, like where each other are, but to really come up with a humanities infrastructure roadmap, because I think that's the piece is, that piece is missing right now. 
so we know where all of us are going to end in three to five years. And to the extent Tom can help with that, that would be huge. Excellent. Um, Peter, do you want to um, take over from here? Sure. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, what a fantastic conversation this has been. Uh, those of you who attend a lot of conferences in Washington, D.C., uh, at some point or another will have been exposed to uh, a federal government uh, speaker who always begins their remarks with uh, the Weasley disclaimer uh, that the views they express are their own and that they're not speaking on behalf of their agency. So if uh, my foot gets inserted in anybody's mouth in the next five minutes, it's mine and not my member presses. Um, I think really this has been the uh, perfect agenda for the final year of the Tome pilot. Uh, as we begin to think about uh, the assessment of the pilot and to contemplate what might come next, uh, because it places Tome in the context of a landscape uh, for open access monographs, which is materially evolved uh, from when we launched uh, just four years ago. Um, and that's exciting. Uh, so I'll start with just uh, two smaller observations. Um, and then um, uh, try to bring it home. The, the first of those is, you know, we, we did, uh, it has to be credited that we did uh, identify some challenges today. Uh, scalability is a concern, discoverability is a concern. No one mentioned preservation today, but we know from other conversations that that's something that we have to keep our eyes on. Um, the, I was particularly struck by Wendy's uh, uh, talk title, uh, Infrastructure from Little Eye to Big Eye, because I think that's exactly the right way uh, to look at the infrastructure challenges in creating an open monograph ecosystem. Um, and from the perspective of presses, uh, I think workflow standardization is going to be a challenge um, uh, moving forward. Uh, but that said, the thing that struck the second smaller observation is the thing that struck me the most about uh, today's conversation is that while it occurred uh, cognizant of funding and monetary issues, it really was uh, a, a conversation driven by value and values, to borrow a phrase from one of Charles's PowerPoints. Um, uh, uh, and, and by values, I believe Charles meant, and I mean, uh, academic values or what we'd all like to believe the values of the academy ought to be uh, on a good day. Um, and so, so we heard no small uh, uh, number of examples of that. Um, we heard um, uh, Celeste talk about uh, aligning with the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. We heard uh, Emily mention uh, a good faith uh, on the part of libraries in approaching uh, fund to mission and fund to open. Uh, Niels talked about community funding. He talked about a set of principles for open infrastructure. So, so I think it's significant that this is initiative and this effort um, is being undertaken uh, with a, a new and, and, and maybe different set of uh, values than marketplace values uh, in mind. I think that's important. Um, so with those two smaller observations, uh, what should one take away from today? Uh, if you know me and you've had the opportunity to hear me um, uh, speak before, you know that sometimes my, um, my go-to uh, uh, author for quotes is Tony Kushner. Um, and um, Tony Kushner talks in Angels in America. He, the, one of the, the key phrases from, uh, from that is the great work begins. Uh, and and um, what I take away from today is that in fact, uh, with apologies to Tony Kushner, it's the great work here has begun. Um, uh, a community of practice has evolved that's clear, uh, that's exciting and, and uh, rewarding to watch. Um, uh, but moving, so, so to move just a little bit beyond the notion of the community of practice that's already uh, uh, emerging, uh, I just in closing mention that in um, part two of Angels in America in Perestroika where Prior Walter delivers his uh, epilogue um, he doesn't just repeat the, you know, the first time we hear the great work begins is when the angel comes crashing through the ceiling at the, uh, uh, at the end of uh, uh, part one millennium. Uh, we hear it again at the very end when Prior Walter's talking with Belize in front of the Bethesda fountain. Um, and uh, in that same um, 
uh, in that same epilogue, Prior Walter also says, uh, the world only spins forward. Uh, and uh, the reason I, I thought of that is when Peter Potter used the phrase muscle memory. Um, I think that's an important phrase. We've, we are developing muscle memory here today. Uh, and, and all of the work that all of the folks who've spoken uh, 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 is evidence of muscle memory. And um, uh, so uh, I, I just, again, I think today's conversation was exactly the right one uh, for the last year of the Tome Pilot. Uh, and I'm grateful to uh, all of you uh, for participating and to, at one point, I think we we're up to 85 uh, folks listening in, which is remarkable, really. Uh, 85 folks listening in and, and uh, sharing their interest and enthusiasm uh, in creating an uh, open uh, monograph ecosystem. Uh, so thanks, everybody. And uh, back over to you, Peter. Excellent. Uh, that was um, a great way to wrap up. I um, want to open it up again um, to anyone um, in the last few minutes, if you want to respond or um, indicate um, sort of what thoughts on the um, next steps and where we where we can go from here. I'll just echo, um, I'm in support of Emily's suggestion as well that um, as I'm on this panel with many um, of my partners and important components of the infrastructure that we're using to support OA, but I was just trying to recollect when is the last mm -hmm. time I had a real conversation with any of them, right? And I think that just highlights that um, there sort of isn't this centralized place and maybe Tom is that to think about that bigger ecosystem and sort of learn from each other about how we can start working towards a shared infrastructure. Um, I just think there's a lot to learn. So I just wanted to um, advocate, advocate for Emily's suggestion as well. I just, uh, I, I've been very struck uh, by a piece of uh, writing uh, that uh, Martin Eve uh, in the UK and uh, our colleague um, in University Press land, Anthony Conn from Liverpool University Press, just wrote in research information. And I think it's a very good piece because it, 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 it articulates the stakes here. And what they say at the end is, um, you know, if we don't invest in helping monographs, the currency of humanities become open access. And I am quoting, we will reach a world where all scientific work is free to read by the public, but all humanities work is prohibitively expensive. We must avoid this elitist world at all costs. And I think that's a very important thing for AAU to listen to, because uh, that is the danger. If we hadn't had the insights of humanists, we would not understand why vaccines are resisted by people. We would not understand why certain uh, groups in society are more resistant to vaccines than others, and we wouldn't have been able to roll out vaccination. So it's just such an important point. If we don't allow our authors to participate in this world of vetted knowledge, we're going to do the whole of society a disservice. So the stakes are very, very high. Couldn't agree more. Um, I think we're brings us about to a close. Um, I don't know if Judy, um, Meredith, um, if you wanna say anything um, as we conclude. Um, otherwise... well, I'll just say thank you to all the panelists and to everyone who participated in this program. I can't top that last line from Charles though. I think that's just a really important insight. Um, but I do wanna say thanks to everyone who um, who spoke and I, you know, I think to, you know, just on behalf of my piece of tome, I, I just think it's wonderful to have hosted this conversation today. Great. So, well, again, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks to the panelists for um, providing a, a great um, discussion, and thanks to all of those who joined us. Um, we're really happy that we were able to to bring everyone together and. And I think we have made some progress here. So I'm um, looking forward to um, 
hopefully next time around when we do this, we'll have a report um, on Tome to be able to discuss and, and really begin to, to dig into next steps. So um, thanks everybody again for joining us and we look forward to, to talking soon in the future. Thanks, Peter.